Good afternoon. Let's start with one element at the top, and that is today we celebrate the 32nd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, the world's first comprehensive civil rights law for persons with disabilities. The ADA inspires the world to see disability through a lens of equity and expands opportunities for persons with disabilities to fully and proudly contribute to global progress. Disability rights are human rights, and ensuring that persons with disabilities can participate in all aspects of society is a priority of this administration. We recognize how disability adds strength to diversity in the fabric of our communities around the globe. As a landmark US law, the ADA sparked an international shift from viewing persons with disabilities as objects of charity to individuals with rights who are valuable members of society. This perspective serves as a beacon to the more than 1 billion persons with disabilities worldwide. That's one in every seven of us. Special Advisor on International Disability Rights, Sarah Mankara, is at the forefront of our efforts to protect the rights of persons, and she travels around the world to disrupt the narrative of disability from a charity-based model to one that is value-based. At the State Department, we strive to be a model for, workplace, for a workplace of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, where all employees are treated with respect. This administration has emphasi emphasized this commitment through Executive Order 1435, in which accessibility has been embedded as a core pillar in reflecting, respecting, and advancing our diversity. As the Secretary's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Winstanley has affirmed, we don't limit our recognition of disability pride or, dis or commitment to disability inclusion to one day or to one month. We strive to recognize these important issues every single day. This ADA anniversary, we recommit to shaping a future in which persons with disabilities enjoy all of their human rights and their fundamental freedoms fully. Every day, we remain committed to promoting disability rights at home and abroad. Yeah. That's it? That's it. OK. Uh, can I ask you about the cases of two uh, American citizens? Um, one, uh, Shireen abu Um can you bring us up to date on the secretary's meeting with her, which may still be going on, I, I guess. So, I, and then the second one is Brittany Greiner, who is back in court again today. Sure. So let me start um, with the family of Shireen Abu Akhla. I can confirm that Secretary Blinken is meeting today uh, at this very, very moment, in fact, uh, with the family of Shireen Abu Akhla. As you know, the secretary has spoken to her family on a number of occasions now. And during the most recent call, uh, he invited her family to meet with him here at the State Department in Washington. I suspect you'll see something from the secretary uh, following the meeting. But I can tell you that the secretary is deeply appreciative of the opportunity to meet with Shireen's family. Not only was she an American citizen, uh, she was a reporter whose fearless pursuit of the truth earned her the profound respect of audiences around the world. He'll use the opportunity to underscore for Shireen's family our deepest condolences on her tragic death and to reiterate the priority uh, we attach to accountability, something we continue uh, to discuss with our Israeli uh, and Palestinian partners uh, as well. Anything else on that before we go on to uh, the case of Brittany Greiner? Um. Well, yeah, I just, did he, does he have anything to say to them in more than what was said, uh, what has been said previously? Well, we have said an awful lot on this case, and as you know. I, I know, and I'm asking if there's anything new in what he's able to tell them today than what he might have been able to say yesterday. Well, but part of this meeting is, yes, the secretary providing the secretary an opportunity to uh, convey messages to them. It will be a message of condolence. Uh, there will be a message of the priority we attach uh, to accountability going forward. But this is also equally an opportunity for the secretary to hear from the family, uh, to hear uh, their important perspective, uh, to have a dialogue uh, back and forth, something we uh, have, have sought to have. I get that. And uh, that's that's fine, but he has spoken with them before. Maybe yes. Not, maybe not face to face. This is the first time in person, and no, obviously. No. So, uh, but does he have anything new to share with them today that he didn't have the last time he spoke? 
uh, it's hard for me to get into the details of a meeting that uh, uh, probably is not concluded just yet. Uh, but what I can say is that he will uh, reiterate the messages that he has conveyed publicly. He will reiterate that them directly and in person to them. Uh, he, I suspect, will also update them on our engagements with our Israeli and Palestinian partners uh, on this case. Uh, okay, well, does, does that mean that once the meeting is over, you can update us on your engagements with the Israel, in I, particular with I, the Israelis, but also with the Palestinians? I, I suspect you will see something from us on this later today, and we'll have more details <coughs> to share after the meeting. Sean. To follow up on that, um, one of the things that the family has been asking for, and they said explicitly that they're going to ask this to the Secretary, is to, for the United States to launch its own probe or for there to be an independent probe into it related. Is that something that the Secretary is going to do? What we have done is something that uh, is in some ways um, uh, unusual, given, uh, but it is not unusual given the priority we have attached to this case, again, as an American citizen uh, and as a reporter uh, whose life was taken under uh, tragic circumstances, and that is the fact that the U.S. security coordinator uh, worked closely with Israeli investigators, with Palestinian investigators, uh, and in this case, did his own summary of those investigations, uh, reaching a series of conclusions. Uh, not only did the team uh, do a forensics examination of the bullet, whose passage from Palestinian uh, authorities to uh, independent examiners. In this case, we facilitated, uh, but concluded based on the two investigations that are being conducted uh, that uh, the bullet that uh, tragically took the life of Shireen Abu Akhla uh, most likely emanated from an IDF position. Uh, and the U.S. Security Coordinator also found no indication uh, that there uh, was any intentionality uh, behind uh, the tragic death uh, of Shireen. Uh, so that is something that we have done. We have uh, published the findings in this case. We believe that by publishing the findings, uh, it speaks to our commitment to uh, pursuing uh, an investigation that is credible, an investigation that is thorough, uh, and importantly, an investigation uh, that culminates in accountability. And it is that question of accountability uh, that we have continued to discuss with our Palestinian partners and, of course, with our Israeli partners as well. Just to follow up on that, I mean, one of the things is that the family says that they actually want some some new, some fresh probe by the United States. So it's basically that's the answer that the Secretary is going to give, that they don't think there's any need for anything new. Well, our focus has been on bridging these two investigation, investigations uh, and doing all that we can to see to it that the investigations that uh, are being carried out are thorough, uh, they're done uh, exhaustively, uh, they are done transparently, uh, and again, that they end in accountability. We made the point uh, shortly after we released the statement on July 4th that uh, we do continue to expect to see accountability. Uh, in the case of the IDF, again, the U.S. Security Coordinator uh, concluded that uh, the bullet most likely emanated from an IDF position. The IDF, of course, uh, is a professional military organization. Uh, and given that, it has the ability to implement processes and procedures uh, to avoid non-combatant casualties. We think that uh, type of accountability is important. It's our collective goal uh, to do everything uh, we possibly can, working with our partners to see to it that something like this cannot happen again. Okay, so I just counted. You used the word accountability four times, four times separately in the last minute. So what's new on the accountability front? And what's new in terms of how you would expect to, to get it? Well, I didn't come out here with a new message. Uh, I came out here to reiterate the message uh, that uh, uh, we have clearly and consistently conveyed, both in public and in private, uh, right. to our partners on this. Uh, okay, I, I get that. I'll stop. You can go on to someone else. But just calling for accountability without actually doing anything to get it. Uh, you were right. That, see, you, you were it. you were right that we are calling for it. Uh, what is also true is that we are having private conversations uh, with our partners in this case, our Palestinian partners and our Israeli partners uh, in this in this instance uh, to promote what we think is important. And it is a word that, as you rightly point out, I have used several times already, uh, even in the past minute, because it is a priority for us. Uh, it is a priority for us that we see appropriate accountability. I just follow up on that again. Sure. The, um... On the accountability, you're saying that there needs to be accountability. Uh, is there any sort of time frame for this? I mean, if, if Israel Israel accepts saying that the IDF keeps saying that it's, it's probing this and they're trying to get to the bottom of this, 
if that probe goes on forever, is that, I mean, is there some sort of time frame in which there needs to be some, some more concrete accountability? Well, we do want to see an investigation that is thorough, uh, that's credible, that's transparent. Uh, and part of that, uh, an investigation that is credible, there has to be an element of timeliness to this. Uh, we do understand that uh, sometimes these uh, elements are uh, run at cross purposes, uh, uh, timeliness and thoroughness, uh, but we want to see an investigation uh, that is both timely, uh, but is also thorough, and that importantly concludes in accountability. Pat. Um, can we turn to Americans detained in Russia? Sure. Okay. Um, with Brittany Griner's hearing today, um, obviously the administration has been very clear that they're you know, working to get her home. Um, but would you say that there are active discussions with the Russians um, to come to some sort of deal to get her home right now? I would say that we have made the case of Brittany Griner, we have made the case of Paul Whelan uh, an absolute priority. And we are working actively, quietly, behind the scenes to do everything we can to see that their wrongful detentions come to an end uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, of course, not going to detail exactly uh, what it is that uh, we are doing, but of course, uh, there has to be, and there is, uh, engagement with Russian authorities on both of these cases, just as we are discussing with relevant authorities around the world. Uh, the cases of Americans who are wrongfully uh, detained and who've been separated from their families for far too long. As we do that, uh, we are working closely with uh, the families. Uh, we are meeting with them. We are having conversations with them. Uh, our consular officers around the world are providing all possible support uh, to Americans who are uh, wrongfully detained. In the case of Brittany Griner, as you know, she had another court appearance today. Uh, our charge, the uh, senior most embassy official uh, currently in Moscow, uh, was present in the courtroom, as was uh, another senior official from our embassy. They had an opportunity uh, to see Brittany Griner, to speak to her, uh, to check in on her uh, welfare. She confirmed that uh, she is doing okay uh, under the circumstances. Uh, and we have routinely conveyed uh, those discussions back uh, to the family, uh, to um, Brittany Griner's wife uh, in this case. We'll continue to do that. And would you say that um, you guys are satisfied with the Russian engagement on these cases? You said there has been engagement, but are you satisfied with the degree to which there has been engagement? We are never going to be satisfied until Brittany Griner is back with her wife, until Paul Whelan is back uh, with his family, until wrongful detainees around the world uh, have been um, uh, uh, released from, from custody. Uh, so we don't look at this in terms of satisfaction. Uh, we look at this uh, through the lens of doing everything we possibly can uh, to see to it uh, that these individuals uh, are reunited uh, with their families as quickly as we can. And just one more question on Mark Vogel, um, an American who was sentenced to 14 years in prison in June um, for the crime of uh, carrying cannabis into the country. Does the State Department view that sentence as appropriate for the crime that he committed? Uh, there's only so much I can say, given privacy considerations in this case. As you know, privacy considerations vary uh, case by case. Uh, but of course, we're aware of a US citizen sentenced in Russia. Uh, we take seriously our responsibility to uh, assist US citizens abroad. Uh, we're monitoring uh, the situation uh, more broadly, and this applies to all Americans who are uh, detained in Russia, be they detained wrongfully in our estimation uh, or otherwise. We insist that the government of Russia allow consistent, timely consular access to all US, citizens, US citizen detainees, uh, including those in pretrial detention in compliance with uh, its various obligations, including those under the Vienna Convention, including those uh, in the context of our bilateral, bilateral uh, relationship. Uh, we've continued to urge Russian authorities to allow this, uh, and we also continue to press for fair and transparent treatment for all U.S. citizens uh, detained in Russia. And then the, the, the term wrongfully detained has not been applied to the case of Mark Vogel. So can you just explain why that's the case, given there are some similarities to the crime he committed and the crime that Brittany Griner committed? Well, each case is unique. Uh, and in determining whether a detention is wrongful, and determining if a detention 
uh, is wrongful, we look at the totality of the circumstances. Uh, and those uh, circumstances are then weighed against a series of uh, criteria and factors. Uh, the Bob Levinson legislation that was passed uh, some years ago, and in fact was just codified in, in key ways uh, into the EO, defines some of those considerations that we look at. Uh, but I want to make an important point. Uh, there is never, um, uh, we never close the book uh, when it comes to any particular case. Uh, we are constantly looking at the facts. We are constantly looking at the circumstances. As we learn more about any given case, as we learn more about the circumstances of detention, the charges, uh, fair trial guarantees, due process, or lack thereof, uh, we are always weighing those developments against the criteria uh, to determine whether an American is uh, wrongfully held or not. Yes, Kita. Sure. Um, seems like uh, Mr. Borrell has called the end of the nuclear negotiations with Iran. In his opinion piece in the Financial Times today, he says that he has he tabled a proposal taking into consideration the steps both sides have to take because he doesn't think there's any more room for compromise. Um, is his proposal fully acceptable to the Biden administration? Well, I'll start with something you've heard before from us, and that is uh, that we're not going to negotiate uh, in public. Uh, what I can say is that we are reviewing the draft understanding on mutual return to full implementation with the JCPOA uh, that the high representative uh, shared with us, as well as with Iran and the other JCPOA participants. Uh, we will share reactions we have directly with uh, the EU. Uh, but as we said already, uh, and this is something you heard uh, as recently as yesterday. There's been an outline of what we believe to be a good deal on the table since March that we have been prepared to accept. Uh, and we understand that this new text that um, Mr. Burrell referred to, um, uh, it's the basis for, uh, its basis is that draft that has been on the table since March. Uh, we are studying the changes that have been proposed by the EU. We'll respond to them uh, in short order. Uh, and we hope that Iran uh, finally and ultimately decides uh, to seize the opportunity that has been before it for some time now. Is there a time frame within which both sides have to answer? I think you saw in the op-ed that uh, Mr. Burrell published today, he didn't allude uh, to a time frame. We are going to be swift in our review uh, of the proposal that uh, he put forward. We know that uh, time is of the essence. Uh, but again, uh, we also know that Iran's nuclear program has galloped forward in such a way uh, that the parameters of uh, the mutual return to compliance that have been in the offing for several months now uh, is to us, to our national interest, far preferable uh, than where we are today. So we are going to continue to pursue a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA um, for as long as it's in our interest to do so. Uh, that remains the case. How can you say that time is of the essence? It, it, time, is, time is an important consideration when, in this. When did, when, well, when did that become, the, when, when did that become important? We, we've, we've always said that. I mean, look, we've been having the same conversation pretty much every day for the last eight months, nine months, even. Uh, and maybe 10 Almost months and it's it's been you know the window the runway has been shortening the window has been closing since the beginning of this year and the fact is that and, the, and so now all of a sudden time is of the essence the, the, fa exactly the fact is mean? what is it supposed to mean to the, the fact Iranian is that energy? the deal that has been available to iran for a number of months now is yeah. still yeah. is still is still in our national security yeah. interest yeah. that will not be the case indefinitely. Uh, we will reach a point, uh, and again, this is a point that I can't define for you right now. Which means uh, it's indefinite. That, That's the very definition of indefinite. I, I think is we have, not? We, may, we may have different definitions of indefinite, but uh, <laughs> this is, this is uh, what, I, what I can tell you, Matt, what you know, uh, is that we will reach a point where it is no longer in our interest uh, to pursue a mutual return to compliance. Right, uh, the I'm point at in, which all of a sudden today time is of the essence uh, when you know you've been saying that for the last eight months and you still can't say you know you say there you can't put a date on anything or that is the very definition of indefinite 
Matt, you, uh, as we've said before, um, the point at which we will pursue alternatives uh, is the point at which it's no longer in our interest uh, to pursue a mutual return to compliance. Well, we, I if, you, already had, you already had a plan. B. I mean, you already had pre prepared for the- We have. We've been, we've been working with, with partners and allies on this for right. some time now. Uh, so the point is that when we reach uh, the, the point where the JCPOA, the non-proliferation benefits it would convey have been eroded by the advancements in Iran's nuclear program, uh, that is the point at which we'll pursue these alternatives, alternatives that we've been discussing for some time now. Just one question on that. Have you guys stopped using the term a few weeks to describe when that time will be for any particular reason? I, I believe the the reference you're alluding to is, is Iran's breakout time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the fact is that uh, when the JCPOA was being fully implemented uh, by Iran in this case, uh, its breakout time at one point was 12 months uh, with the decision on the part of the previous administration to leave a deal that was verifiably working to constrain Iran's nuclear program. Uh, Iran's nuclear program in the preceding few years has been able to gallop forward in such a way that Iran's breakout time uh, is now measured in weeks or less. So that has not changed. Yeah. I have one last one on this. Is this development the reason the hearing tomorrow at the House Foreign Affairs Committee has been canceled or postponed? I, I'm I'm not aware of any connection, uh, but if we have any uh, uh, details to offer on that hearing, we'll let you know. Uh, yes. Uh, on Tunisia, now that there is a projected outcome, um, what is the U.S. view of the referendum? Well, we note the outcome that has uh, been reported by the Independent High Authority for Elections, or ICE, and Civil Society Election Observers. Uh, the referendum uh, has been marked by low turnout. That is something that we do note. Uh, a broad range of Tunisia's civil society, media, and political parties have expressed deep concerns regarding the referendum. And in particular, <laughs> we know the widespread concerns among many Tunisians uh, regarding the lack of an inclusive and transparent process and limited scope for genuine public debate during the drafting of the new constitution. Uh, we also note concerns that the new constitution includes weakened checks and balances uh, that could compromise the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Uh, with legislative elections scheduled for the end of the year, we continue to stress the importance uh, of respect for the separation of powers and an inclusive and transparent electoral law that enables wide participation uh, in those elections. Yes. Um, thank you so much. Did, can I ask um, your comment on upcoming uh, Erdogan Putin <laughs> meeting in Sochi, uh, both in terms of PR element of it, also uh, about in terms of the fact that you know. Putin is being allowed to meet with, you know, a world leader, let alone a NATO member, another time. I'll need to defer to our Turkish allies to uh, speak to uh, the intent and any agenda uh, for President uh, Erdogan's uh, potential uh, travel. What I can say is that our Turkish allies have been instrumental in uh, working to secure uh, the grain deal uh, that was signed last week, and of course the onus is now uh, on Moscow to stand by and to uphold the commitments that it has made. Uh, Turkey has uh, been an important uh, mediator, uh, has sought to uh, play a, um, a, uh, a role uh, mediating um, between uh, the parties more broadly in the context of Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, we've said consistently that uh, we support all efforts to bring Russia's aggression to an end that are coordinated fully in the first instance with Ukraine, uh, but also with um, the United States and our allies and partners. No, I, know, I know that you also responded to uh, some of Lavrov's comments yesterday when I was in the room, uh, but Russia says explicitly that it actually seeks some regime change in Ukraine. I'm wondering, uh, Lavrov today even repeated the same statement. That's an uh, you know, apparent reversal from uh, their wartime messaging. Well, it is a messaging reversal. Uh, I'm not sure that is a policy uh, reversal. Uh, it's a messaging reversal in that uh, you, were, you were right. Uh, before February 24th, we heard consistently uh, the lie from various Kremlin officials uh, that this was about some perceived threat from Ukraine, from NATO, from the United States. Um, we called all of that uh, a lie at the time. And since then, but especially in, in recent days, uh, the Russians have been doing as good a job of anyone 
uh, of debunking uh, their own disinformation uh, and their own lies. Uh, refer to what uh, Sergey Lavrov said yesterday, and you alluded to this. He called uh, President Zelensky and his government in, Mos in, uh, in Kyiv a quote unquote unacceptable regime, uh, making clear uh, that, um, uh, uh, that this was not <laughs> what Russia uh, purported it to be uh, just the previous week. Uh, he admitted that Russia's quote unquote geographical goals go well beyond uh, the Donbass to include Kherson, Zaporizhia, uh, other sovereign regions of Ukraine. It hasn't just been uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. It wasn't all that long ago, as Secretary Blinken has pointed out on a couple of occasions now, that President Putin spoke, uh, compared himself to Peter the Great, uh, noted that uh, when Peter went to war with Sweden, he was simply looking to take back uh, what Peter thought belonged to Russia. Uh, President Putin went on to note uh, that Russia is again looking to take back uh, what is theirs. So <clears throat> repeatedly, senior Russian officials uh, have put to the lie uh, just about everything that we heard from them prior to the invasion. They have made clear in doing so, uh, this is not a defensive operation. Uh, this is, in fact, uh, what it always appeared to be, and that is a war of territorial conquest. Uh, that's why it's so important that countries around the world uh, stand uh, not only with Ukraine, uh, stand with Ukraine to help it defend its, its sovereignty, its territorial integrity, its independence, uh, but also to stand with uh, the rules-based international order uh, that for decades now, since the end of World War II, uh, has made clear uh, that uh, we cannot reside in a world that, where might makes right, where large countries can bully the small ones, uh, where a country's foreign policy can be dictated uh, by any other country. And very quickly, on, uh, to follow up on Russian imprisonment question, albeit my question is about non-US citizens. Has the commission leadership yesterday uh, sent out a letter to the administration urging them to use every possible instrument in our toolkit to release a political prisoner Vladimir Kaya Mursa? Do you have any response to that? Uh, we have consistently called uh, for his release. We have noted uh, that his detention comes in the context uh, of a broader crackdown on civil society, on uh, fundamental freedoms, on human rights within Russia. Uh, this is a government that uh, has made very clear that it is not willing to um, uh, countenance dissent uh, or vocal opposition. Uh, these are the actions of a regime, uh, of a government, uh, that is um, fundamentally uh, afraid of uh, the ability of its citizens to speak the truth, uh, to spread the truth, uh, and to exercise, in doing so, uh, the rights that are as universal to them as they are to uh, people around the world. Uh, Sean. Something more in Russia. Sure. Um, the space program. Sure. Uh, Russia announcing that it will no longer participate after 2024 in the International Space Station. Uh, how does the United States feel about this? Does it have confirmation that this is the case? How will it affect the space program? The We've space seen Russia's statement that uh, it plans to leave the International Space Station after 2024. Uh, it's an unfortunate development given the critical scientific work performed at the ISS, uh, the valuable professional collaboration our space agencies have had over the years. Uh, and especially in light of our renewed agreement uh, on space flight uh, cooperation. I expect NASA will have uh, more details for you. Uh, do you hope that they'll revisit this, or do you think is that something that's uh, underway in negotiations to, or some, any sort of discussion about this? Uh, I, I understand that we were taken by surprise uh, by the public statement that went out. Uh, I'm not aware of, uh, I'm not aware that uh, discussions on, on this front have started yet, but would need to refer you to NASA for that. I know that you don't like to talk about history, but since you mentioned in relation to Peter, Peter the Great and, uh, and, and Foreign Minister Lavrov and, and, and President Putin, given that Peter the Great also was the one who opened up Russia to the West going on a <coughs> grand tour of Europe, built Russia, what was then the modern Russian Navy, do you find it at all uh, jarring that they would pull out of uh, a scientific thing like the ISS now, given their give, given President Putin's apparent desire to be seen as a modern day explorer. 
I, I will leave that to uh, the Russians to speak to their motivations. Uh, here, I will just note that uh, the United States and Russia, we have cooperated on space exploration uh, for uh, years now over the course uh, of decades. Uh, we obviously, um, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has obviously changed uh, our relationship fundamentally, but there are still aspects of our, our relationship, uh, including our joint pursuits in science, joint pursuits uh, in safety, people-to-people -people ties uh, that we would like to see preserved, uh, and the Russians are sending uh, a contrary signal here. Uh, yes? Um, so Israel uh, revealed today that in May, Russia fired at one of its military jets. I was wondering if the State Department is aware of this, and also um, if they agree with Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz's assessment that it was a one-off, and uh, have they communicated with Russia at all over this incident? I would need to refer you to our Israeli partners to speak to any engagements that they've had with Russia uh, regarding this. Uh, that's not something we would weigh in on. Yes. Um, Ned, anything on the Turkish killing of the SDF second in Kamat? We, uh, we've called for an immediate de-escalation in northern Syria. Uh, we believe it's crucial for all sides to maintain and respect ceasefire zones to enhance stability in Syria and work towards uh, a political solution to the conflict. And, and Ned, so in just the past month, um, an estimated of 18 SDF members have been killed by Turkey. So is there anything else that the U.S. can do apart from just calling on your ally to uh, cease the hostilities? Because if Turkey continues at this rate, you may run out of partners soon. So a no-fly zone, that's something that the SDF have been kind of floating the idea of a no-fly zone. Is that something that you guys can support or is that a... We continue to have these discussions with uh, key partners and allies. We continue to have these discussions with our, our Turkish allies. Uh, we've made clear to them in private what we've made clear uh, in public. And this is something that we reiterated again uh, last week. Uh, the deep concerns we have about uh, the potential for renewed military uh, activity in northern Syria, uh, in particular its impact on the civilian population. Uh, we have uh, made clear uh, our specific concern that any renewed offensive uh, of this sort, any broader offensive of this sort, could set back uh, the significant gains that the coalition has made uh, against Daesh uh, in recent years. It could have uh, humanitarian implications on the civilian population uh, in the region, and it would certainly uh, not be in the interest of uh, the political process pursuant to UN Security Council Resolution 2254. Just quickly, so is that for a renewed incursion by Turkey into Syria, or does that also apply to separatic kind of drone attacks on SDF commanders? We're, we're speaking to a uh, renewed offensive into, uh, into northeast Syria. Can I follow yeah. up on that, please? Sure. So you said we continue discussion. The question was about no-fly zone. Are you discussing no-fly zone with anybody in the region? Uh, I would need to refer you to uh, the Department of Defense. Uh, we are, uh, for the part of the State Department, we are having uh, diplomatic engagements uh, with our allies and partners, of course, with our Turkish allies in this case. About what? Uh, about our concern uh, regarding the, p the potential for a broader and renewed military offensive in northeastern Syria. Yes. So in North Korea, South Korean government officials said that there is a possibility North Korea will conduct its seventh nuclear test on the occasion of Korean War Armistice Day, which is tomorrow, the, 20, the 27th of this month. So is the State Department concerned, uh, sharing this concern or discussing about this matter with South Korean government? And does the U.S. still assess that North Korea will conduct its nuclear tests soon? Our concerns regarding the potential for a seventh North Korean nuclear test have not abated. Uh, we have spoken uh, publicly to these concerns for a couple of months now. Uh, you have heard uh, assessments that our uh, ROK counterparts have made public, uh, that the DPRK regime has conducted all necessary pre preparations for a potential uh, nuclear test. Uh, that has not changed. Uh, we have continued to be uh, very clear uh, in our public statements, uh, but also working closely uh, with our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific and well beyond uh, to make clear that uh, any additional nuclear test that the DPRK conducts uh, would carry uh, tremendous costs. And we've been working with uh, allies and partners in New York, uh, capitals in the Indo-Pacific and around the world um, to send a very clear message uh, to the DPRK regarding this. Yes. Um, ask you on the same topic, 
is the State Department reviewing to update the U.S. North Korea policy as South Korea is crafting its roadmap for their own uh, North Korean policy that is known as the Audacious Plan, which is including uh, the measures to implement economic cooperation with North Korea and provide security guarantees for the country. When this administration first came into office, we spent several months conducting uh, our own policy review, taking a look at what the prior administration uh, had done vis-a-vis -vis the DPRK, what previous administrations had done vis-a-vis uh, -vis the DPRK, uh, what had worked, but uh, unfortunately, uh, more of what uh, has not worked over the course uh, of decades uh, when it comes to uh, the DPRK and specifically uh, its WMD program. So we undertook a comprehensive review uh, the policy that resulted from that is the policy that we have articulated publicly and the one that we've pursued uh, for the better part of almost two years now. Uh, it is a policy that believes that uh, dialogue and diplomacy and engagement um, are the best courses by which we can achieve the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we've made clear as a, as a result of that policy review that we harbor no hostile intent towards the DPRK. In fact, uh, we have made clear our willingness to engage in dialogue uh, with the DPRK uh, to determine how we might be able to move forward uh, with that diplomacy. Unfortunately, uh, those requests, those um, invitations uh, have gone substantively unanswered. Yeah. Yes. Questions. Uh, first on Iraq, uh, Iraqi Foreign Minister has said that uh, Iraq will ask the Security Council to vote on a resolution uh, that pushes the uh, Turkish <coughs> forces uh, out of Iraq. Will the U.S. support uh, Iraq in this scenario? Uh, we're aware of the complaint made by the government of Iraq at the Security Council uh, and the statement that the Security Council released today on this. Uh, we reaffirm our position uh, that military action in Iraq should, be res should respect Iraqi sovereignty, should respect Iraqi territorial integrity. Uh, we expressed our, our condolences, we reiterate our condolences to the families uh, and loved ones of those who were killed or injured. Uh, and we emphasize the importance of ensuring civilians uh, are protected. But we need to refer you to uh, the government of Iraq for further comment. But do you support, will you support Iraq in the UN Security Council? In we've, we've supported those principles, including the principles that were articulated in the UN Security Council uh, statement that was, that was released today. And uh, uh, any comment on the clashes between uh, the uh, Libyan military factions in Tripoli? This is something that is highly concerning uh, to us. We urge all groups to refrain from violence. Uh, Ambassador Norland, our uh, special envoy, spoke with Abdul Hamid uh, Dabaiba and Fatih Bashaga on Sunday, uh, both committed to finding ways to de-escalate the situation and to prevent further loss of life. Uh, we believe that the recent clashes demonstrate the urgent necessity for Libya's political leaders to immediately and embrace uh, an agreed upon path to elections which can install a truly legitimate uh, unified government to serve the interests of all Libyans. And uh, one on uh, Hezbollah, the Secretary General, uh, who uh, issued a new threat against Israel over the maritime dispute and said if the extraction of gas from Karish begins in September before Lebanon gets its rights, we will have a problem. Uh, will this, uh, this threat affect the U.S. mediation and uh, what about this deadline, September deadline? We've seen uh, these reports. Uh, we don't respond to threats, uh, but we do remain committed to facilitating negotiations between Lebanon and Israel to reach a decision on the delimitation of the maritime boundary. Uh, progress towards a resolution can only be achieved through negotiations by the two governments. Uh, we welcome the consultative and open spirit of the parties to reach a decision a final decision which has the potential to yield greater stability, security, and prosperity uh, for both Lebanon at, and Israel, as well as for the region. Uh, and we do believe that a resolution is possible. Any update on uh, uh, Special Envoy or Advisor uh, Augustine uh, travel to Lebanon? Uh, I don't have any travel to speak to, but he has engaged, uh, remain engaged uh, with the parties since his last travel to the region. Simon. Thanks. Um, I wonder if you had any update uh, after the last week's developments with the Ukrainian Prosecutor General being being dismissed, and particularly from the U.S. point of view, um, you know, does that change your position in terms of the uh, atrocity crime advisory group that um, was working closely with the prosecutor? You know, is that still is that sort of still legal? 
Sure. Uh, let me make a, a couple broad points, and then I'll come to the uh, uh, issue of the prosecutor general. Um, broadly, as you know, uh, for uh, over the course of months, we have rallied the world to respond to Ukraine's, um, excuse me, to respond to Russia's unprovoked and unjustified uh, war of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, ensuring a secure and stable Europe and protecting the international rules-based order, uh, that is profoundly in our national interest. Uh, but beyond the external threat uh, that Ukraine faces from Russia, uh, Ukraine, like many other governments around the world, continues to face another threat to its long-term success as a sovereign, independent, democratic, and pros prosperous country, and that's corruption. Uh, corruption must be combated even as Ukraine defends itself uh, against Russia's war of aggression. Uh, Russia's war against Ukraine poses an external threat, but <laughs> corruption poses uh, an internal threat. Uh, and the threat that uh, corruption poses can uh, be uh, corrosive to democracy, uh, to sovereignty, uh, to uh, the freedoms uh, that the people of Ukraine so desperately wish to retain. Uh, so even as we support Ukraine by providing security assistance, we will support sustained efforts in Ukraine to increase transparency, uh, to strengthen democratic institutions, independent anti-corruption infrastructure, and the rule of law while building resilience against corruption. Uh, in June, Ukraine took a major step forward uh, in its European aspirations when the EU granted it candidate status. Uh, but Ukraine knows it still has work to do, even as it continues uh, to face Russia's uh, brutal attacks. Uh, and together with our partners and allies, we'll continue to stand with our Ukrainian partners as they stand up to all threats, external and internal, uh, to their chosen democratic path. Uh, and we'll continue to stand with Ukraine in its ongoing efforts to advance democratic and human rights uh, reforms. When it comes to the prosecutor general, uh, we continue to monitor the situation closely. We join the people of Ukraine in emphasizing the importance of transparently appointing a highly qualified and truly independent successor as prosecutor general. The independence and impartiality of the <clears throat> prosecutor general is vital to ensuring the integrity of accountability efforts in Ukraine. The judicial system must be fair, impartial, independent to ensure that both victims and the accused receive justice. And the recent final selection of the specialized anti-corruption prosecutor <coughs> was an encouraging sign, and we look forward to a swift appointment. Uh, and we hope that this momentum continues with, again, the selection of an independent prosecutor general who meets high standards of professional ethics, as well as personal integrity, uh, and our assistance and advisory program, excuse me, our assistance and advisory programs uh, support these strategic reform uh, initiatives. We'll continue to provide robust support for the work of the Office of the Prosecutor General uh, for reform efforts, just as we will continue uh, to work uh, with the Office of the Prosecutor General as an institution in the interim uh, on the important efforts uh, through the ACA, uh, together with our international partners, uh, to hold Russians accountable uh, for uh, the crimes that they have committed in the conduct of this war. Now on the corruption piece, obviously the U.S. is... is uh, pledged a lot of money, a lot of, as well as the weapons and, and arms that are going there. There's a lot of uh, humanitarian support. Have, have you got any? Have you got any evidence that, since you say you know Ukraine has work to do, like that some of that money uh, may be being lost to corruption, or you know, is that? Do you have a way of knowing whether it has? Well, we know that oversight of these funds is is critical. It is something that we have baked into um, the provision of these funds. Uh, in addition to the extensive accountability and transparency mechanisms uh, built into the use of funds and our foreign assistance, uh, the funding package we requested from Congress, um, we requested and the Congress approved, included millions of dollars to support additional oversight measures, including additional funding for existing inspectors general. Uh, and the supplemental legislation also contained provisions explicitly calling for the DOD IG to review the use of security assistance funds and to provide a written report of that review to Congress. So it's something we're paying very close attention to. Sorry, I don't, I don't want to extend this, but the recent final selection of the special anti-corruption, this guy was chosen in December. In the grand scheme of things. It's now July, the end of July. The, uh, he was chosen in December, nothing was done about it, and nothing has still been done about and it. And that's why we're urging for his swift appointment. Swift? Okay, like swift, like the Iran, 
Yeah. I, no, come on. I, I, don't, I, I don't understand this. We, we, are, we are urging our Ukrainian partners to move forward with, with his appointment. Yeah, but you've been urging your Ukrainian partners to move forward with this appointment since mid-December, and he was finally, or actually even earlier, and he was finally chosen at the end of December. Now, obviously, there was a little thing called the Russian invasion, which got in the way, but it's not, this guy's final selection is not recent. I, I mean, in what world is December recent? Uh, Matt, we are urging his appointment, our, our broader point, uh, which uh, despite your um, it's not uh, oral with the, with, 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 uh, with the descriptor, that that uh, <laughs> is that uh, our Ukrainian partners, even in the midst of Russia's brutal aggression, uh, can't let their eye off the ball uh, when it comes to corruption. Well, okay. Well, so are you concerned still about the, uh, the, the issue of corruption in, uh, in, in Ukraine? Uh, of course, we're concerned with the issue of corruption uh, in Ukraine, as we are in countries around the world. Uh, we know, too, that this is something that uh, this government in Ukraine uh, has sought to address. Uh, it's imperative that uh, they continue uh, efforts to address it, because, as I said just a moment ago, uh, corruption can have a corrosive effect on democracy, on sovereignty, on independence uh, in a way that uh, is... Um, that stands in contrast to what we are trying to help our Ukrainian partners do in defending them in defending themselves uh, against Russia's aggression. Yes. Uh, do you have any comments on China's most recent comment that uh, on Speaker Pelosi's potential upcoming trip to Taiwan? Uh, I don't. We don't get in a habit of uh, taking part in a back and forth uh, with our uh, Chinese uh, counterparts. In this case, with uh, my uh, MFA uh, counterpart, what we have said on this uh, still stands. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, the Speaker's office has not uh, announced any travel, uh, and our approach to uh, Taiwan has not changed in any way. Yes, Alex. Thank you. Ned, uh, different region, South Caucasus. I've seen your uh, readouts on sec Secretary's calls yesterday to President Ali and Pashinyan. There's one line that I've seen, actually, correct me if I'm wrong, right, three or four times since January, that Secretary reiterated his offer of assistance in helping and facilitating the you know, process both sides. Uh, does that mean the previous offers have been turned down? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that. It means that we've been able to achieve what we think is a degree of progress uh, and through continued engagements and uh, diplomatic conversations with our Armenian, with our Azerbaijani uh, partners in this case, we think we can continue that momentum. Uh, so the secretary obviously has had a number of calls uh, with the Armenian and Azerbaijani leadership. Uh, but there are a number of people, senior uh, officials in this building, uh, who have engaged with uh, their counterparts at all levels to continue uh, this uh, momentum uh, and to uh, continue to offer our assistance uh, in um, the issues as we seek a long-term comprehensive peace. But there's one caveat, though, which is a Minsk group. Uh, you know, yesterday, President Aliyev's office issued a statement. There was no reference to Minsk group. If you're an uh, uh, average Azerbaijani, you will see your president is lambasting Minsk Group every other day. And then you have the State Department readouts referring to very Minsk Group um, you know, uh, as a possible, they say, uh, uh, way to go. My question is, there's clearly a mismatch here in terms of how you see it and how uh, they got it. We've made clear in our statements, including, I believe, in the readouts yesterday, uh, that the United States stands ready to assist uh, these two countries and our like-minded partners uh, in whichever way, whichever format is most effective. Uh, we have been a co-chair of the Minsk Group since 1994, but uh, as we've demonstrated, we're also willing to engage bilaterally uh, with the countries uh, to help Armenia and Azerbaijan find uh, that long-term comprehensive peace. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.